Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, and also with you. Welcome to this service of morning worship for Sunday the 15th of November. Let us pray. Gracious God, as together we come to you today, we acknowledge our mixed emotions and our differing gifts and needs. May our desire to serve unite us, may the truth of the gospel encourage us, and may the example of your Son inspire us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We come to God as one from whom no secrets are hidden, to ask for his forgiveness and peace. We say together. God our Father, long-suffering, full of grace and truth, you create us from nothing and give us life. You give your faithful people new life in the water of baptism. You do not turn your face from us, nor cast us aside. We confess that we have sinned against you and against our neighbour. We have wounded your love and marred your image in us. Restore us for the sake of your Son, and bring us to heavenly joy in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the God of love bring us back to himself, forgive us our sins, and assure us of his eternal love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. An unlived life, that is the choice of a third slave we're about to hear of in our reading shortly. He is entrusted with one talent, or a bag of gold to you and I, but he can take the risk of using it to trade with others. It just might grow, and he just might grow with it, but he won't. His talent will not see the light of day. It will not benefit anyone. It's a thoroughly self-centred choice, and it's not what God intends. We are destined for obtaining salvation. That means taking the gifts we have been given and using them in the ever-risky enterprise of love. sink a mountain to a plain. Give me the childlike praying love, which longs to build thy love again. Thy love let it my heart empower, and all my simple soul Today's reading is taken from Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. 
For it is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trusty slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trusty slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And on my return... I would have received what was my own with interest. <clears throat> so take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, Throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I would have precious time with thee, and longer live for this alone, to send and to be sent for thee. you think of when you hear the word talent? Outside of the church context, you might think of television shows like Britain's Got Talent, where people of various levels of skill compete for a huge amount of prize money and a chance to perform in the Royal Variety performance. You might also think of things that you are good at, sport, cookery, creative arts, you might feel you have a talent, a natural aptitude for one of these, or you might feel you have a significant lack of talent. In our Bible reading today, we heard the parable of the talents, and we're talking about another meaning of the word talent, which was a coin worth a large amount of money. You might remember that talents are also to be found in the Old Testament, where they were used as a unit of measurement for gold and silver. 
By New Testament times, talent was a term used to represent a large amount of money as well as being an actual coin. Scholars think that one talent would have been worth about 15 years worth of wages for an average labourer. So those who heard the parable of the talents for the first time would know that Jesus was talking about something of very great value. The servant who had been given five talents would be extremely rich, therefore, and by doubling his stake, he would have made his master even richer. So, too, would the servant who'd been given two talents. Even the servant who was given just one talent would have known that he was the custodian of something extremely valuable. And so Jesus leads us in the parable to wonder why this servant didn't do as his colleagues had done. The servant's answer is that he believed his master to be unfair, to be guilty of reaping where he had not sown and gathering where he did not winnow. I think that the first audience of this parable would have interpreted what Jesus meant in a different way to how we see it these days. After all, there are social constraints to the story for Jewish hearers. If the third servant had taken one talent to the bankers, as his master suggested, he would have been guilty under Jewish law of committing usury, receiving interest from another person. There was an understanding in Jewish culture that one did not take from the share of another. And so the master might have given his servants the job of stewarding his resources and increasing them so that he, the master, was not seen to be profiting at someone else's expense. He could blame his servants, who were perhaps believed not to know any better. Once you start to unpack the story, there are lots of unknowns to discover, and lots of things that we take for granted, because we have traditionally interpreted the story as being allegorical. I was very surprised when I read the story in detail when preparing this sermon, that it's not quite the cosy story of making the best of what you've been given, that I'd often presumed in the past. At first glance, what happens to the third servant is not at all what we would expect of Jesus. Here he says, to everyone who has, more will be given, and to those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. That doesn't fit kindly with the message of the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, where we see Jesus promising that the meek will inherit the earth and that the poor will be blessed. So what's going on? Let's look at the parable in the context of the rest of the gospel. The story is placed in the middle of what scholars often call the great denunciation, the part of the gospel where Jesus is shown to condemn the scribes and the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, for their hypocrisy and inconsistency. It's an apocalyptic part of the gospel where Jesus talks about the coming of the Son of Man, the end of the age and the coming judgment. So we might expect there to be something quite severe about the tone Jesus takes with people who do not keep to his commandments or who keep the law to extremes. We should also remember that when the gospel was being written, the temple in Jerusalem had been torn down by the Romans, replaced with a military camp. And this was, of course, a cause of terrible distress for the Jewish people, making them slaves again, just as they had been in the Old Testament. So we can see that we're dealing with a story where what we have done in our lives is going to be important. What we have and haven't done is going to impact on our standing with God. Traditionally, we've interpreted this parable as meaning we have to take care of what we have. Viewed as an allegory, a way to show a message, the master is God, all of the servants are us humans, with differing abilities and different understandings of what we do in our lives with our God-given talents. The physical talent becomes an allegorical talent, and we will be judged by God if we don't use what we've been given by him for his glory. So the first servant, who has the largest amount of money, uses it for God's glory and is congratulated by God for magnifying it and admitted into the kingdom of heaven. The second servant is likewise given praise and is allowed into the joy of the master. But the third servant, who squanders the talent he's been given, meets with God's anger. 
We're told that the parable means we should act like the first two servants and not the third. Doing nothing is not an option. It's not a comfortable story, and perhaps that's the point. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild, is not the Jesus we see here. Instead, we must understand that God has expectations of all of us, and that we all need to do all that we can to meet them. When Jesus returns, as did the master in the story, he will not expect to see us hanging around and waiting for him to tell us what to do. It isn't long until Advent, where we start to explore the message of Jesus' coming, and every year in that time of penitence and preparation, we are encouraged to explore what his coming means for us and for the world. We can't stand by and let it wash over us until Christmas happens and everything is sorted. We don't want life to be like it was in the story The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, always winter and never Christmas, and so we need to get busy. What would Jesus do if he came back tomorrow and saw us failing to provide for the poor and the homeless? He's made it pretty clear to us that we should be dealing with that. What would he say if he saw us refusing to challenge corruption in public life, allowing injustices without intervention? He's made us well aware of our responsibilities in that department too. What will happen if we continue to squander the earth's resources and yet at the same time claim to be good stewards of God's creation? We are already living the consequences of that. Let's not think too much of our talents in terms of what we can already do. We need to think about how we can apply those talents to what still needs doing. How can we shift our worldview so that when our master comes, we are not found wanting? We can learn from the parable of the talents that we need to be active, not passive. As we continue in this difficult period of our country's life and of the life of the world, it's hard to feel we have choices. But regardless of, God's, of what's going on, we can always be living the kind of lives that Jesus wants us to, showing the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, self-control. If we live by these talents, we should walk by these talents in the way of the cross, in the way of the Spirit. Amen.
Let us now declare our faith in the God who loves us and is with us. We say together. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. And we believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Covered as God's people in prayer, we can uncover God's will for our lives and find encouragement for the future. Let us come together and present all our petitions at God's feet. Holy God, we pray for the church here on earth, in its different branches in every country, and for our own diocese, and for our bishops, Rachel and Robert, for all priests and deacons and all manner of laity. Holy God, if we are presuming on your mercy, alert us and shatter our complacency. If we are doubting your mercy, affirm in us the reality of your forgiveness. May we as a church encourage and warn, but never condemn, acknowledge sin, but never judge. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, we pray for peace in our world today, that people may learn to live together in harmony and peace, receiving all they need to flourish and to grow. Holy God, raise up prophets to speak out your truth and draw attention to whatever needs changing in our world, our expectations and assumptions, our management of resources and finances, our systems of government and our attitudes. May all peoples come to recognise your truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, we pray that we may all use our gifts wisely and well for the good of our neighbour 
and to extend the kingdom of God here on earth. We pray for the overworked to the unemployed, and we ask that they may receive through human care the tenderness and hope of Christ. Holy God, fill our homes and places of work with so much love that tensions and barriers melt away and conflicts are resolved and troubles lightened by being lovingly shared. Open our hearts to hope again where we had given up. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, may all in misery and despair turn to find you close beside them in their heartache, not condemning but loving them in their pain. We pray for all who are ill at this time, for those in hospital, at home or in full-time care. And we pray for those who care for them. We pray that the church may be a wise steward of the ministry of Christ, living and proclaiming his message of healing and wholeness. Give comfort and support to those in their troubles. May all who are locked in terror or guilt be set free. And may those whose long-term illness wearies be strengthened to persevere and freed from resentment. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, Lord of the living and the dead, we commend to your mercy all who have died and those who are left behind to mourn. All whose anniversary may be near at this time, and we thank you for that eternal healing, which frees us from all pain and suffering. May we rest in God's comfort and peace of heaven. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, in the unity of Lawrence and all your saints, we praise your holy name and ask you to help us to, to rise to meet the challenge of the day and the week before us. Let us be an example to others who do not know you. We appeal to you, Lord, for guidance, encouragement and enthusiasm. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us now bring all our prayers together in the words that Jesus himself gave us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
and we've come to the end of our service, so let's pray together remembering our Bible reading today. Christ as a light illumine and guide me, Christ as a shield overshadow me, Christ under me, Christ over me, Christ beside me on my left and my right. This day be within and without me, lowly and meek, yet all-powerful. Be in the heart of each to whom I speak, in the mouth of each who speaks unto me. This day be within and without me, lowly and meek, yet all-powerful. Christ as a light, Christ as a shield, Christ beside me on my left and my right. May we look to the good of others, be great at giving encouragement and bless as we are blessed. In Jesus' name, Amen. As we start a new week of service, I urge you to reflect on the gifts God has given you to nurture and to care for. Be thankful to God for all that you have and your talents. Ask him to give you courage and strength to invest your gifts, to grow his kingdom as he desires. So then, let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, Amen. Amen.